Um, my name is Chris Wright. I'm CTO at Red Hat. And I wanted to talk today about the perpetual pursuit of excellence. Um, and you, you saw earlier, it's in this digital transformation kind of bucket. Um, there are some slides here that are suspiciously corporately branded, and, and I apologize for that. Uh, but in, you know, I'm selfish, and I was trying to save time. All right, so this is, I think, it, it's my hypothesis. I don't think it's really something that, that is largely um, contentious. But <clears throat> open source today is really the source of, of technology innovation. You look across all of the different uh, projects in open source communities, and they are at the cutting edge of, of technology, whether it's cloud or, or machine learning or you know, serverless, all these new uh, development models and, and infrastructure and platform projects. Uh, these are developed in open source. Uh, certainly, this is important to Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat's business is about building products that are derived from open source projects. Uh, and so the more we see this innovation happening in the upstream open source communities, uh, you know, the more excited we are and the more we're able to bring these new technologies and, and new innovations to, to our customers who are trying to modernize themselves and go through the, the digital transformation. Um, this is just sort of our redux view of that same, that same concept, which is there are a collection of, of projects those projects go through kind of a life cycle from, a, from our point of view, which includes the total pure upstream uh, project. In some cases, there's a, a, a point in time that does community cu curation or, or combination of different components. And then for us, ultimately, those become products. So you see things like uh, Kubernetes upstream, uh, OpenShift origin as a combined community distribution, and then OpenShift uh, container platform as a, as a product from Red Hat. So when you look at that kind of from upstream to productization, uh, there's a couple of points where people start to look at a technology from the point of view of what can I do with it? How does it, how does it drive value or business value for, for me and my company? Um, Starting at the, at the beginning, you see the, the innovation cycle. You've got um, a kind of DIY point on that, that time horizon, which is people who are excited about the technology bringing it into, into their businesses and playing with it internally. Um, you see a productization and standardization phase at the, at the end of that cycle. We live mostly in the upstream. We Red Hat, we live mostly in the upstream. And then that productization, and standardization place. We work with some customers early on in the DIY space, but mostly we're looking at, we're directly upstream or we're working in productization. And that standardization is, is where you get ubiquity. De facto standardization, something like Linux, which is everywhere at this point. Um, and I think it's worth noting that Kubernetes has won. Um, Kubernetes has been around for a, a short period of time. It was only announced approximately three years ago. And in that time period, it's gone from a new exciting open source project to a de facto standard for container orchestration in the industry. And that has happened really rapidly. So if you roll back in time, 2001, VMware introduced server virtualization for x86. Uh, 2006, Amazon introduced EC2. Um, 2011, maybe, was, was OpenStack. 2014, Kubernetes. And today, Kubernetes is emerging as a, as a de facto standard for container orchestration. I think this is awesome. We, we had reInvent um, and saw a couple of key announcements there, really talking about Kubernetes. And in the keynote announcement for Kubernetes, the, the announcement for Amazon doing uh, EKS was one of the most loudly applauded announcements. So you really see the excitement and enthusiasm around, around Kubernetes. Another piece of this standardization is actual standards. Um, standards in open source have kind of an interesting 
relationship with one another. In a certain sense, if we're all com collaborating on the same code base, we create that de facto standardization. And what we really need is formalization of what the APIs are that we expect are consistent, stable, and not going to change throughout the lifespan of a uh, major release or even the long, uh, multiple major releases, the long lifespan of a, of a project. So for example, Linux, which is standards compliant with standards like POSIX, has a very well understood system call interface. And that system call interface is binary compatible. That system call interface is something that has changed over time, so it's, it's augmented. Uh, the core system calls haven't really changed. Many of those are, are you know, predating Linux. And my personal opinion is, if it weren't for Linus waking up with a broken laptop and very grumpy one morning when somebody uh, uh, introduced a regression that meant his box didn't boot, we would be in a really different place today for containers. Containers are fundamentally reliant on this well-defined interface between the Linux kernel and, and user space applications. And if it, you know, if it weren't for that morning when Linus woke up and then decreed in, in probably not very nice language, thou shalt not break user space, uh, that really began something that today we're, we're reaping the benefits of. So standardization in a more formal setting is specifications, it's things we know and love, uh, move slowly, and uh, in many cases it can become politicized and it's complicated. So we're, we're doing this balance, uh, de facto standardization and open source code, and then working in communities like OCI where we actually do create some form of a specification, write code to it, and create some commonality across container runtimes and container image formats. Uh, we're particularly excited about OCI having released 1.0 this summer, and we've been working on a project, uh, Diane mentioned Cryo, which is uh, really leveraging some of that work in OCI plus the container runtime interfa interface in, in Kubernetes being pluggable to create what we think is a, a really nice architectural fit to Kubernetes for managing launching containers. And we've got other projects in that space. You may have heard of Scopio or, or Builda. Um, so a couple of different projects in how we can build and launch um, container, container images based on some open source code and as well as some standardized specifications. So that comes, brings us here. Uh, and I, I think this is a really impressive, uh, you know, kind of the, the NASCAR logo shot, but it just shows you what Diane was talking about uh, earlier, the, the breadth of this community. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff happening in the OpenShift Commons community. Uh, clearly, OpenShift is built around Kubernetes and, and containers and container images. Uh, but it's, it's also a ecosystem of users and, and uh, you know, other commercial companies looking to work together to build this, this common collaborative environment. Uh, I think it's really impressive to look at everybody who's involved. And I want just to say thank you to everybody who's, who's participating here in OpenShift Commons. Who is here for the first time? Okay, that is amazing. Um, if, if you can't see, I'd say two thirds or three quarters of the room raised their hand is here for the first time, so that's fantastic, welcome. Uh, actually, I didn't expect that, you surprised me. Uh, so to the digital transformation bit, it's not my favorite topic only because it feels marketing buzzwordy, um, but it is a real thing, people talk about it all the time, and the despite the buzzwords, there's, there's real business work going on under the hood. Um, what we see with our customers is this move towards um, speed and agility, and initially trying to capture some efficiency internally. So efficiency can be as simple as use the same building block, standard building block, something like Linux. Use it across your, your, your entire infrastructure. Um, agility and speed and come when we start using cloud technologies, we're using APIs to manage infrastructure, uh, we can automate our work using containers to deliver applications, maybe even building applications in a modern software architecture like microservices. And this is the world that our customers live in. So on, the, on that left-hand side, efficiency could easily mean I have 
uh, applications that are on hardware that aren't moving, they've been there for 20 years, they run my business, they're the core business kind of transaction processing engine. And on the other end, I want to produce uh, a web front end for my customers, consumers that are interacting with me as a business, and I need to be competitive with startups that are doing things really fundamentally differently, born in the cloud and, and not necessarily owning all the same kind of assets that, that the traditional businesses have. So this is the space where our customers live, and we work a lot to bridge these two worlds together. So we can't leave behind that core transaction processing engine that may actually be running the business, uh, but we also want to help our customers transform and move into this you know, modern, modern world and move more rapidly. The two key things here are the cloud and um, modern software architectures, uh, cloud native applications and, and cloud infrastructure, hybrid cloud infrastructure. So for us, we've been talking for quite some time about the hybrid cloud. The hybrid cloud is uh, a concept that it allows application portability across a lot of different infrastructures. So you see on the far left there you have bare metal, uh, uh, you have virtualized infrastructure, you've got private clouds, and you've got public clouds. And all of these are potential target platforms for any of the applications that our customers are going to run their applications on. Sitting above that is some application platform that provides the consistency, the runtime consistency across all of those platforms. And that's where you get portability and the ability to kind of uh, not be locked to one particular deployment scenario. And then a, a bunch of other things up and down the stack in terms of management and connectivity with storage and networking and, and developer tooling. But here we're really focused on that application tier. Uh, it's just a quick blowout talk showing a bunch of applications and moving from hybrid cloud to multi-cloud. So you see those, that cloud picture has changed to include a bunch of public cloud providers. And again, the focus here is, is OpenShift and OpenShift providing that consistency across all those footprints so that you can run your applications independently of whether they're uh, an older application or a more modern application, different run times. Anything that runs on Linux uh, can, can run in this environment. Same picture with the hybrid cloud. And it, as I said, anything that runs on Linux can, can run in this environment because containers f are fundamentally uh, Linux or um, put a different way, containers are operating system technology. Uh, I, whenever I say containers are Linux, people say, well, what about Windows containers? Um, absolutely, they exist, and I think the point is that it's an operating system level technology, so the applications that run on those, on those operating systems continue to run in a containerized environment. There's really, from an application point of view, there's very little uh, that's different between running directly on the, the operating system or running containerized on the operating system. So let's talk about hybrid apps. And, and this is a complete hypothetical situation. Um, so if you're wondering at points in time, does this specific example actually make sense? It's a fair question. It's really meant to illustrate, uh, illustrate a point. One way you can deploy your application, this is kind of a standard, bog standard application with some application logic, a database, and messaging between components. Um, one way you can deploy that is completely on premise. So again, uh, using something like an open, uh, OpenShift platform, running these containerized components on premise, whether that's bare metal, virtualized, or, or a private cloud internally. You, and th this is in the context of hybrid apps. You can take this same application stack and move it off premise to the public cloud. And again, it's that underlying infrastructure, that platform that's created consistency. Uh, and this is sort of the either or approach to hybrid cloud, meaning you could deploy here or you could deploy there. Um, our customers are also interested in, in an and scenario. I like to deploy here and there. And again, you could argue this is a strange way to, to, to deploy your application. That's really not the point. The point is that your application is made up of components, and the components could be deployed in 
on different targets or different locations. So here you see uh, core application logic in the database on premise, and your messaging moved off premise into the cloud. You may decide that uh, you don't actually want to manage your database. And you may look to a cloud service provider to give you the, the management behind the database and use it as a service. So you, you maintain the schema. You, it's your data, obviously. Uh, but you're now uh, consuming somebody else's service. So you can see the same application uh, messaging, and, and you've offloaded some of your responsibilities into a, a database service. And here you can see it stretching across multiple public clouds. So it's the same on-premise application. Uh, you've got your DB in one uh, public cloud and messaging in another. And lather, rinse, repeat with all these different uh, choices of using a service. Uh, we happen to provide a service, uh, or we're working to provide a service uh, around Fuse, which is a messaging or integration service that could be used here. So this is looking at OpenShift providing a service specifically in the context of messaging between applications. Um, and we did some announcements with uh, Microsoft showing that you can run, uh, we're plant working together to be able to run Windows containers on Windows servers and, and Linux containers on Linux servers managed by, by, open, uh, by OpenShift. And here you can see a uh, .NET app and a uh, SQL Server. Actually, SQL Server runs on Linux and actually runs really well. Uh, and .NET has, is also accessible on Linux, so you have choice there. Uh, and here you see just an extension of this you know, kind of picture where we're starting to make a more complicated application, and the application is starting to consume external services. Some of these services are services that are provided potentially by other platforms, uh, by hosting cloud service provider, and those services are things that, that we're working to make accessible through the uh, service broker, which you'll hear. I won't talk much about it, but you'll hear about it a little bit later today. Really important part of integrating into an external environment. So we had this world where we have legacy applications, uh, which potentially show up as, as APIs or services. We've got new applications that we're building. We need to create connectivity and bridges between those things, and a, the service broker is a place that can do that, as well as connect you to, uh, uh, again, cloud services, native cloud services or software as a service offerings. So my role is really meant to be focused on where we're going, what is their technology strategy, what are things that are interesting happening in the industry that we want to make sure from a Red Hat point of view we're paying attention to, we're understanding where we intersect, how we can work with those emerging communities. Uh, so I wanted to switch gears here a little bit and talk about that. Uh, most of this is going to go pretty quickly and hopefully we'll get, you'll get time to hear in much more detail about a lot of these topics later today. You saw the kind of hybrid cloud picture that we laid out. Um, the, that platform is really a core component to our, our hybrid cloud story. Uh, we're trying to work towards efficiencies for two different types of uh, persona. One is the developer, and the other is um, you know, kind of the operations teams. And from a developer point of view, our focus is providing efficiency for the developer so that effectively all lines of code directly translate to business value. You're not spending your time uh, building frameworks and bootstrapping infrastructure. You're really just building application logic and, and from a business point of view, business logic. Um, on the management side, we're, we're moving in the direction of more and more policy-defined management so that you're not dealing with the details on a, on a uh, kind of box-by-box box or, or cluster-by-cluster cluster perspective, but rather dealing with higher-level policies. And certainly, you, you need to be able to dig in when something goes wrong and figure out where things are broken and how to fix things. Um, but being able to define higher-level uh, goals, policies, are kind of these, these two key concepts on the developer side, efficiency, and on the operations side, uh, efficiency. 
the way I think about it is as you create well-defined um, separation of, of duties or separation of concern, you allow each persona to optimize what they're working on. So giving developers autonomy allows them to move more rapidly. You're not sitting there waiting. You entered a trouble ticket and you're waiting for two weeks to get a VM that's blessed by IT. Um, but an idle developer is somebody who's, A, you're getting bored, and B, you're, you're, you're just not being productive. So uh, it, this kind of separation of concern allows the operations teams to pay attention to the platforms and the developers to write code and, and pull in the uh, you know, languages, frameworks, whatever that they're interested in building their applications from without a, uh, a lot of kind of headaches from, from having to work with the IT side. While we need to maintain some, res like we need to do this efficiently but also responsibly. So uh, we'll talk briefly at the end about, about security and the kind of DevSecOps or security lifecycle of an application. So you don't want a free-for-all. You don't want to have a situation where you put things in production that you don't even know what's there. Uh, we've seen a lot of compromises recently uh, that really result from that kind of moving faster, running with scissors, basically, moving faster than the, than the whole environment is ready to uh, understands and can really maintain security around. One of the things I think is interesting is is that a platform is a place where you can create that separation of duty. So similar to an API, um, an API allows a certain type of innovation to happen on either side. So if you have a well-defined boundary, uh, you, you understand how you interact across the boundary, you're free to innovate on one side and, and free to innovate on the other side. It's similar here with creating a platform. Platform serves like an API in this in this sense, it's a, it's, an, it's a way for operations and developers to communicate. Uh, it's a little different from a traditional API, but, but similar in concept. And this is just you know, all the goodness that comes from using open source and the ability to move things across uh, platforms, uh, underlying infrastructure, and really tap into that community innovation, which to me is the engine, that's, the an innovation engine that's driving uh, what happens today in the industry. So I, I called this the perpetual pursuit of excellence. Um, I, I see the industry working in these three kind of key areas, trying to continually improve the user experience. So that could be a consumer user, um, typically, but not always. Uh, always trying to improve the operational experience and the developer experience. Um, in the middle, on the ops side, it's really the same illities. It's reliability, availability, uh, stability, security, all, all the standard things that you think of from, from an IT ops side, and that's where we're trying to push towards that policy-defined um, infrastructure. Having a platform gives you a target to build policy around, and one of the things that I think is interesting and important, especially for Kubernetes, is as you onboard more and more unique types of workloads onto a platform, that platform becomes more and more valuable. And I don't mean just in any one context, I mean across the industry. So if you have that sort of 80-20 where you've found a sweet spot and you're, you, you are working well for 80% of the industry, you're leaving out 20% of the industry. Uh, you know, maybe it's a bell curve and these are niche corner cases. If you can bring those same niche corner cases onto the same platform, that platform is more useful. I would argue that it's also building towards the future. Architecturally, you tend to have to do things in code, refactoring the code to make that platform withstand the test of time as you bring on more exotic corner cases. And to me, the example there is, is again, Linux, having been around for over 20 years and evolving with the industry and taking on more and more use cases so that today, you know, it's in my pocket on my phone, it's in my TV, it's in uh, cars, it's in supercomputers, it's, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It's running all these different workloads across many different kinds of hardware. And in the 
uh, analogous space in Kubernetes, we're starting to see more and more workloads come to the platform. And I think that's a really important thing for this community to, to think about and to work towards enabling together. On the developer side, we've mentioned most of this. It's about speed, agility, those kind of things. It's really um, reducing the amount of scope that the developer has to manage and offloading that into the plot platform, uh, consuming more and more things as services through APIs and, and developing small services and exposing them as, as services and APIs. On the user experience side, um, I think this is an interesting space because it's, again, mostly thought of in the consumer uh, arena. And you're, you're trying to build simple, intuitive interfaces. Uh, they're contextual. They understand who you are and even are pleasant to use. It's a delightful user experience. You, in a context where you're trying to do business through this application, you're trying to reduce the cognitive load on the user so that they're not stuck trying to figure out their application. You're really focusing on your buying decisions. Uh, I think we need to take those concepts and be aware of them and consider those in the context of projects like Kubernetes. Targeting a different persona who's a user of the software, not a consumer, maybe a developer. Ease of use is increasingly important as you see that explosion of innovation in the open source community that we talked about earlier. Uh, it means there's a lot more choices that developers are making and there's a lot more uh, understanding that you, you have to you come up to speed with in order to even use something unless you're making it really simple and easy to use. And I think that's one of the benefits of containers and one of the exciting things about um, uh, container orchestration is you can build these sort of turnkey components and plug them into your application. The delightful, intuitive, personalized pieces from a consumer application point of view today are also starting to really mean AI is under the hood. Uh, and so while that's about contextualizing and giving recommendations, um, it's also how we'll use uh, data coming out of distributed systems and understand the current health of the system. So I think these are really important things to consider. Uh, and I, I think the user experience is sometimes overlooked uh, when you target developers who, like me, are excited about the bits and bytes. And, uh, then the problem is you, there's too many things and you can't keep track of them all. So AI, um, this is where, again, our view is creating this continuity between the legacy applications, modern applications, which I would define as a modern so software architecture like microservices and uh, intelligent applications. And we want to run those on the same, uh, same platform, op OpenShift. Uh, I'll skip over the insights piece, but we're doing some of this work in OpenShift IO. OpenShift IO can take advantage of, of some kind of uh, machine learning to give recommendations when user uh, developer is writing code and you're pulling in a dependency in your uh, Maven in your palm file that is known buggy as a problem with the stack that you're creating, security vulnerability, for example. Uh, just, this is just a simple example of how we're using AI internally at Red Hat. S similar with the Access Insights one that I skipped over. But if you also go from a community point of view, Rad Analytics is a project that, that we've kick-started to bring some of these analytics tools to OpenShift. Uh, specifically, uh, a lot of the work is done in the, around Spark. And w our goal is to show that this platform is good for running modern, interesting, innovative uh, new engines. So you'll hear today about machine learning, we work with a number of different partners uh, on bringing these kind of machine learning engines to our platform. Similar story with blockchain, very much a partner-centric view of the world for Red Hat. Uh, we have a commercial ecosystem called the OpenShift Blockchain Initiative, and we work there to bring blockchain apps to OpenShift. So you see this kind of bring the new technology to a common platform is the consistent theme here. Who's he? in here from the telco industry? Small handful of people. All right. You have your work cut out for you, and this is an exciting space. Um, 5G and mobile edge computing 
is kind of the next generation telco networks. So today the networks are 4G, SDN and NFV have been the buzzwords in, in telco. Uh, the next generation is 5G and with 5G you get low latency, high bandwidth, dense connectivity right at the edge of the network. With that, you have the ability, and with alongside NFV, you have the ability to start running more interesting application workloads at that edge, including the traditional uh, examples would be autonomous vehicles, augmented and virtual reality. Uh, and what's interesting is many of the companies that are looking into this are seeing containers as the optimal way to run those workloads. Really important uh, considerations around performance, jitter, reliability. You've got messaging, signaling that's going on that's managing phone calls, so you don't want to drop those. So it's a bit of a different environment than a traditional uh, enterprise data center or cloud application. But these are things that will be really interesting for the Kubernetes uh, community to take on as new challenges. You already see some of this work happening in uh, scheduling and being aware of things like SRIOV NICs and, and GPUs, where GPUs are interesting at the edge as well. So I think there's a, a lot of work that's happening here that will directly impact uh, the Kubernetes community and OpenShift. Lambda has made a, a big impact, at least uh, in certain circles in the industry. There's a lot of conversation around serverless and function as a service. Uh, to me, it's the scale of, of eliminating scope from the developer. So an, an asynchronous event-driven programming model is ideal. It's, it's an optimal programming model. model. It's also difficult. Uh, so here we're creating a platform that takes care of, of most everything for you, and you're just writing your business logic as code that's triggered by some event. Uh, at the very far end, you have a bare metal server where you're managing the application plus the operating system and, and, and the whole mess. So uh, you can see this sort of spectrum. We're moving up and to the right there. We've been investing in a project called OpenWhisk and bringing that to uh, the OpenShift platform. So this is bringing that event-driven uh, function programming environment to OpenShift. And a topic that I'm sure you will hear about again today as well as repeatedly throughout KubeCon is uh, a service mesh. So microservices being an architectural pattern for building modern uh, software applications, as you break apart an application into components and services, the network becomes really fundamental to that application. Most application developers aren't network engineers. They're, they're not spending their time understanding the network. And creating a platform that, cr that manages that network connectivity between all the service components that may be horizontally scalable and ba load balanced uh, becomes more and more important for developers to be efficient. So um, here you see kind of an architectural diagram where you see uh, some pieces of, of Istio at, as a service mesh in the platform, and then some Envoy sidecars deployed with runtimes, uh, really hosting your application and managing that network connectivity through, through those uh, sidecars between all the different components in your application. A lot of benefits that come along with this approach uh, so that you know, now you're offloading your responsibility to the platform, you're not having to build in a di whole different set of client libraries for every different client. Uh, and really, if you expect every developer to understand how to build an application, distributed application with uh, a lot of services, you're probably setting your devel developers up for uh, some headaches and complications when they, you know, th simple things like the network falls apart and breaks down and retries aren't in are inconsistent across the platform. So the Istio project, uh, again, leverages Envoy as a, as a uh, proxy. And this is something that we've been working on at Red Hat and, and working together with the OpenShift community and the broader Kubernetes and, and commu general communities around bringing this to, to our platform. And I think this is the last thing I will touch on. I mentioned it briefly earlier, DevSecOps. Security is always important whenever we ask any of our customers where security is in their kind of priorities. It's always at the top of the list. Um, but it's also this balance of how do you move quickly and maintain security. Uh, so recently, there was a new project announced called Graphius and an associated project called Critus, something that, that we're uh, also involved in. 
bringing this to the OpenShift platform as one of the pieces of, of the um, software supply chain in your infrastructure. So knowing, managing metadata around every artifact, knowing where it is, how it's deployed, and then some policy around whether it's OK to deploy this thing and, and in which context is a really important part of security so that you can ensure that you've pulled things from uh, safe artifact repositories and you're putting things into production that are, that are essentially blessed and have the right metadata associated with them. So I think that's probably all I have time for. I'm sure I went a little over, uh, but thank you for listening. This is a really important community for Red Hat, uh, and I'm stoked to see so many new people. That's a really cool thing. And the, the message I wanted to leave you with is that OpenShift is a platform. It's building those kind of swim lanes or that separation of concern, and as Open source is the innovation engine for technology. OpenShift is a platform that's, that's ripe for absorbing that technology and bringing it to developers and, and operations teams. So thank you. Have a great day.